reasoning with parables, seeds of thought. I always hesitate to begin by reference to the mysterious, to the things of God and to his creation that are hard for us to understand. Things like why, in order to find rest, do we have to take upon us the yoke of Christ? Why, in order to become wise, must we become fools for Christ's sake? Why does evil exist? Why does why do children get sick? Why does the word genocide exist as a concept in our minds when God is all good, all powerful, and all loving? These are the kinds of questions that can keep us up late into the night, often leading to conclusions that sound something like, well, I know this is true, but I don't fully understand why. And this is the kind of um, reasoning that we can have, not just with the things of God and the things of his creation, but with other things in other realms of life. I think about driving successfully in a car requires little knowledge of the complex machinery of a car. The hidden complexity of that machinery of an automobile presses in on our consciousness when a couple things happen. We run into someone, <laughs> when someone runs into us, or when there's mechanical failure. And initially, that's met with a, a sense of anxiety, perhaps, that's short term usually, um, and also the fact that we don't get to go where we need to go. And so when we don't get to go where we need to go, when the car doesn't provide that function for us, it's only when that stops making, you know, that transportation necessary that we start to perceive, we start to acknowledge, analyze, and to make sense of the myriad of parts inside of a car for many of us. When our car fails, our incompetence about the nature of that complex machinery immediately becomes present. Likewise, when it comes to the things of God, to the divine, when things fall apart, when things break down, our lack of knowledge can come, become very present in our minds. We're acutely aware of that. And, you know, a car can indeed be understood by a mechanically inclined individual. Not this individual, <laughs> but a mechanically inclined individual can completely understand a car. But when it comes to the things of God, it's a little more complex. There's no one person that knows everything here today. And just as a mechanic might resort to saying things like, a spark plug is like a match to explain things to us, I believe that Jesus often resorted to parables to explain the nature of God's kingdom to us. Parables provide a way forward. They provide a way to get the proverbial car going again. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the nature of parables, and we're going to look at one in particular. But I'm going to identify one essential quality of parables, and that's their indirectness. Their indirectness. As a primary teaching method of Jesus, parables provide a way to indirectly communicate. They provide a way to not maybe say, they provide a way to say something that can't be directly stated, in other words. They provide a way to say that thing A is like thing B, or that this over here is like this over there. They're not the same, but there's a similarity. There's a likeness. There's a comparison the person who speaks the parable is asking you to make. One way to illustrate this kind of thinking is to consider if I were to ask you, what is the church? And I'm not asking what does this church physically look like, but what is the church? How do the um, New Testament writers describe the nature of the church? How would you describe it? Well, you might say the church is the body of Christ, and we are, are members or parts of that body. You might even say that the church is like uh, the bride of Christ. 
and he is the groom. Maybe you would say that the church is kind of like God's family, and we are his sons and daughters. You may even say that the church is um, a temple of God. We are the living stones of that temple. He is the cornerstone, and the Holy Spirit indwells this temple. All of those pictures of what the church is are used in the New Testament. And they're indirect in a way. They communicate meaning, but they don't exactly say in a definitive definition, this is a church, the church is like this or like that. This indirectness poses some valuable um, positive qualities, but it also has some drawbacks when we think about parables. What are some drawbacks of being very indirect? Well, one of the drawbacks, I think, is if you're trying to define Christian doctrine, like the nature of salvation or the nature of the Trinity, you probably don't want to start with parables or even just use parables. You would want to use clear, direct verses of Scripture, and then you can use parables to illustrate that idea. And if you only use parables, you can often lead to strange doctrine and weird personal interpretations that if you don't line up with clear verses of scripture and teaching can lead to confusion because of that indirectness. Here's another way to imagine what I'm saying. If I were to speak only in parables for an entire day, what would be resisted? What would I not be able to communicate to you if I could hypothetically speak in parables an entire day? I'm not that creative, but if you could speak in parables for a, do- a day, a week, a month, what would I not be able to say to my wife or my children or to you? One of the things that I'm going to suggest that they resist is this sort of pride in the totalizing power of reason. Okay? And I'm not speaking against reason here today. I'm talking about the complete confidence that our reasoning capabilities can make sense of everything. Let me explain what I mean by reference to the English poet John Milton, who in Paradise Lost personifies pride in the person of, or in the fallen angel, Lucifer. Let me read a couple lines from John Milton's Paradise Lost for you, describing Lucifer. He trusted to have equaled the Most High. If he opposed, and with ambitious aim against the throne and monarchy of God, raised in pious war, in heaven and battle proud with vain attempt, him, the almighty power, hurled headlong, flaming from the ethereal sky. The mindset of Lucifer, of someone who has this totalizing pride and reason and their own capabilities, puts himself on a status to be equal with God yet totally (coughs) independent from God. And you have to hear that this appeal to independence, yet equality with God, is similar to the serpent in the garden, speaking to the first human ears. You will be like God. That's the appeal. Lucifer falls in love with his own findings, his own productions, And this totalizing power and reason also falls in love with its own findings, its own conclusions, its own productions. It embodies this sheer human pride and the human capability to understand things absolutely, completely, unconditionally, in a way that makes their way of reasoning absolutely sufficient to the point where the idea even of God, of the transcendent, beyond the human, becomes unnecessary. That's the thought process of someone who has a pride in the totalizing power of reason. The person who says that nothing is true outside of their own nice and tidy conception of reality says that all important facts have been discovered. 
And there's nothing really important left to be discovered that's really going to change their way of seeing the world. This is a person who seeks to build the Tower of Babel, who says that they can build human structures that makes, again, the idea of the transcendent completely unnecessary. This is the person who denies the most necessary and perhaps the most courageous confrontation with our own human being. The question sounds something like this. What could I possibly do to make up for, to atone, to cleanse for my blatant, repeated, and constant sins? The times I've fallen short. What could ever make that right? Who could ever take me from the shipwreck of this world and put me on dry ground? These questions simply are not necessary to the pure rationalist who has this sort of pride in their own capability. Why? It's because they're relying by faith on what they know or what they believe can be known by the instruments of reason. Maybe you've met someone like this, and maybe parts of this reside in you, as I think it all, all of us have a hint of this sinful nature. In either case, I think there is a remedy, and it's in the form of a question. What must I do to be saved? And even the most rational person will definitely conclude that it's not the rational faculty that saves them. What saves us? It's faith. It's a conviction for things unseen. It's hope in God-given human transformation to be born again, to be constantly sanctified, to be transformed by God. It is love of God. It is love of our neighbor. These are the essential qualities of what saves us, faith, hope, and love. And it's not a faith in the totalizing power of reason. I believe as Christians we should walk fully into the mysterious elements of our faith, the things about God, the things about his creation. We don't have to wait till the proverbial car falls apart. When I first became a Christian, I thought I had it all figured out. I really did. I thought I had an end to mystery. I had arrived. And you know, I had arrived at the start of a very long journey. <laughs> and it's taken me time, took, took me quite a bit of time to realize that. And today, I think what I know is sufficient. I know who saves me. And today, what I don't know is also sufficient. I know the Holy Spirit teaches me all things and leads me into all truth. And I can say the things I know and the things I don't know with a sense of confidence, knowing that it is a process, especially when we encounter difficult teachings of Jesus or of the Bible in general, things of God, things of his creation, things we don't understand. Those are the things that should not shake us, but should in fact encourage our faith, our hope, and our love. I'm going to look at one example that is a identified, self-identified, difficult teaching of Jesus, and kind of go through that. From John 6, um, I'm looking at a handful of verses, 52 to 71. Um, this is a moment after Jesus has claimed that he is the bread of life, the living bread that came down from heaven. And anyone making this claim deserves to get a response from people. And here, we're jumping in with the Jews responding to Jesus. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. <clears throat> this is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. 
He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Last part. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, for he, though one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So, the claim that identifies this difficult teaching is that Jesus says, My flesh is true blood, sorry, my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats me will live because of me. It's rather mysterious how on the table surrounding us are the flesh and blood of Christ. What that exactly means is a matter of um, complex theological discussion. I'll just say that. Whether it's a ceremony commemorating, whether it's an actual transformation, you can read a lot of different takes on what exactly this difficult teaching means, and yet you may not have it all solved. You may not solve the inevitable mystery of this teaching, which I believe there is some inherent mystery that we have to leave there. But I know this much, but I also know that I accept this teaching. How is that possible? Well, personally, Jesus has provided me with sustenance, nourishment for the soul, true food that doesn't mold, true living water that continues to provide sustenance and growth and encouragement and life that is not man-made. And man may not live by bread alone. Man cannot live by bread alone. This is, this is a teaching that I believe is embodied in this idea of blood and wine. Along with a lot of other difficult teachings, I believe there's an essence here that is very similar to many other teachings about Jesus and his kingdom. And that essence might be called the upside-down nature of the kingdom. So when Paul says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but those being to those being saved it is the power of God, he's talking about the upside-down nature of things, where it's the power of God to one person, it's foolishness to another person. Talking as Jesus was to a huge crowd. Some saw the power of God, the words of eternal life and what he was teaching. Others saw it as foolishness. That's just the nature of the kingdom and the nature of our lives. And I think we have to be okay with saying that sometimes people will agree with us. We have to be okay with that. At the same time, some people may not understand us and may see what we're saying as utter foolishness. That's the nature of the kingdom. The other part that I want to look at here is this question. Do you also wish to go away? <clears throat> that question has always struck me. Jesus is turning, I imagine, looking at his disciples in the eye and saying, do you also wish to go away? You know, that's a big question. And I think the reason I'm so intrigued by it is because it's asking for an authentic response. 
authenticity. Do you wish to go away? This is calling us to be authentic. And there are a few things more important in this life than being authentic with ourselves and with others in a way that will allow us to say, you know, I don't fully understand the mysterious elements here. Jesus, teach me. We should be willing to say that. Authentic truth keeps your soul from withering from all the tragedies of the world. And if you feel desperate, really desperate, be 100% authentic. Or at least, don't lie. <laughs> and be truthful to yourself. There is immense freedom in saying that we just don't understand the mysteries of God sometimes. We understand a lot of things, but there are, there's room for us to say, you know, I don't know. Spirit of God, teach me. We don't know how a baby is formed in the womb. We have a lot of insights into that process, but even the Psalms speak about the nature of that rather mysterious process, how a baby is exactly formed, or the nature of how big the cosmos is. We'll never understand that in its complete complexity. And that's okay. And that's what I'm trying to say, is that it's okay to say that we don't know those things. What's the alternative, though? What's the alternative to saying, authentically, I don't know. There's some mysterious elements. Well, in a word, it might be deceitfulness. Deceiving ourselves, deceiving others. This can make people miserable beyond belief. Deceit. And it leads to resentment. It leads to, even, at the end of the day, vengefulness. Even. Just as sin leads to death, when the seeds of deceitfulness are planted and we start deceiving ourselves and pushing things aside, trimming the facts to fit our theory, there's danger on the horizon. It is a seat, I believe, that led to some of the worst tragedies of the 20th century and in many ways poses some of the greatest threat to today and to the future. <clears throat> Do you wish to go away? Peter responds, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. This is Peter accepting humbly the yoke of Christ. And the yoke of Christ is a heavy burden, but yet provides ultimate peace, freedom, and rest. It's paradoxical. But he accepts that, that Jesus will teach him and lead him into all truth. You have the words of eternal life. Where can we go? Even though he admits this is a difficult teaching, who can understand it? But he believes. When we accept this yoke of Christ, I believe this will allow us, and this is going to sound paradoxical, this will allow us to reason with God. Of course, the famous verse here is from Isaiah. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Note that I'm not saying that we should just learn to reason with our own rational capacities and faculties, nor should we just depend on the reasoning of other very intellectual, smart scientists or researchers or other people that might know more than us. But what I'm saying is that we should reason, but with God. And I began by saying that sometimes when we reason with God, it's when things fall apart. And that's absolutely true. Perhaps that's more true than the alternative. When we come to reason with God, when things are great. When things are beautiful, when things are sublime, beyond our capability to understand. And I had just such an experience, it was about a decade ago, where the beauty of God's creation brought me to the Creator, and to question and to reason with Him. In ways, at the time, I didn't quite know what I was doing. I wasn't a believer at this time. I was in college. 10, 12 years ago. My family was in northern Minnesota. We stay at a cabin on the water. It's 30 minutes from Canada. Totally isolated. There's a town like 15 miles away. There's no street lights, no sidewalks. It's in the woods. And at the time, I just started running as a hobby. And I wanted to push myself. It was later in the day. I'd eaten dinner. And I was running. And I was like, I'm going to push it as far as I can possibly go. 
and I kept running and I kept running and I think I ran about eight miles and I was like I need to turn back and it was getting dark and it got really dark <laughs> And then I started to fear that I was going to get mauled by a bear or something was going to happen, like a car not seeing me. It was really dangerous. Again, I was really dumb in college and young and not really thinking this through. I was new to running. I didn't consider all these things. But then it got really dark. And yet, something caught my eye in the sky. And I realized it was August, north, way north. And... Um, there is something silver and blue, and what I described it as at the time was tin foil in the sky and blue lights, silver lights shining and shaking it. And I had no idea what the northern lights were <laughs> that looked like this, but that was happening all around me. And I just stopped. I didn't even have the vocabulary, I didn't know what it was. And I was brought literally to my knees. I stopped, sat on a rock, contemplated what I now know to be God, but something transcendent, something beyond me that I couldn't even identify. But it, you know, brought me closer to God because I was reasoning, how is this possible? What is this? I didn't know, and I don't think I fully understand how the Northern Lights operate. And you can find a scientific definition of what's happening, but there's something about when a, things just seem right that you get to reason with God, and you get to see his creation. And there are people that never reason with God, and they become hard-hearted. They become stubborn. They become deceitful and distorted. God is really calling all of us, all the time, to come before him, to reason with him, at the dinner table, on our car drives, on our walks or runs, at our workplaces. These are places where God wants us to bring him into the picture. Not just when things go wrong, but maybe when life's just normal. So let's reason with God as we look at one parable here. The parable of the mustard seed, which we began reading. This parable is one of the more well-known parables, and, and that's exactly why I've chosen it. We've heard it before. But let's look a little deeper here. The parable of the mustard seed. This is from Mark 4, 30 through 34. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nest in its shade. And I'm going to stop there. The thing about the mustard seed is that in the Greco-Roman world, it was proverbially known for its smallness of size, even though it was known that there were smaller seeds like the cypress in the world. One mustard seed is one millimeter in diameter, it, and it takes about 750 of these seeds to equal um, one gram. 750 seeds to equal one gram. And 453 grams is one pound. The black mustard seed, when it germinates, it takes about five days to grow about 10 feet in height. And it produces big leaves at the bottom and at the top where birds like to sit, not just for the shade, but also for the seeds. There is a plethora of Old Testament passages about birds. We tend to focus on the seeds, but let's look at the birds and their potential significance here. <clears throat> here is one verse of many from Ezekiel, spoken by the Lord in the book of Ezekiel, 17.23. On the mountain height of Israel... I will plant a seed in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar until it every kind of bird will live. Sorry, under it every kind of bird will live. In the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. So these kinds of passages have been used to suggest 
that the birds are like the Gentiles. Every kind of bird, every kind of person will come to nest under this gigantic tree that will flourish. And quite honestly, there's a lot of debate here of whether the cedar is the same as a mustard plant. And it's really inconclusive when it comes to that, but at least it gets us thinking, what is the significance of these birds nesting under the plant? Historically, the church has agreed on several interpretations of the mustard seed parable. One is that it represents the growth and development of the church, especially in the first thousand years post-Constantine. There was this view of Christianity on the rise to take over much of the world in terms of its influence and power, and that that growth was similar to the seed growing into a plant. The other interpretation is that this is about the individual spiritual growth, maturing faith from a seed to a plant. And then the final sort of historical agreed upon understanding is that this is about the progression of Jesus's life from birth to death, where he was buried in a tomb in a garden and mistaken for a gardener, and that he is the sower who sows the seeds. More contemporary critics take a little bit of a different approach, and they say that it's a representation of the parent uh, or relative insignificance of Jesus' earthly ministry in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Galilee, and it's spread throughout all the world today, and that that growth, that continual progression and development is still here today. So, two things are certain about this parable. Two things. One is that Jesus spoke this because of the critics of his contemporaries. He was addressing their criticisms, and he spoke this as a response to them. Two, Jesus is asserting what God is doing to set things right, whatever that might look like. And it's noteworthy that there's a relative indirectness, and that's why I'm canvassing all these different approaches, because its indirectness welcomes different ways to look at it that all, I think, in many ways are potentially true. Like the cross, the mustard seed is staggering in its ability to challenge us, our human perception, about insignificance. Things that we see as insignificant, things that we see as too small worth even seeing, a small itty bitty seed, right? All of a sudden takes on incredible significance in this parable. We often fail to see a seed planted by God. We look through a glass darkly. And we need to start to see things that are small, seemingly in insignificant, and not disparage things that are called insignificant. Because God has always worked that way, from small beginnings to a massive kingdom. And the important tagline here that happens within the parable that really caps off a lot of parables that Jesus speaks. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. I believe this is a lesson about audience, a lesson about awareness of who we're talking to, and put it this way, we have to be okay with the fact that we're resident aliens with true citizenship in heaven and that there are people that will see what we say as foolish, but we know it to be the power of God for salvation. And some people will hear us differently. And sometimes, some people might have more questions after talking with us, but that's okay because that might lead them to the truth. And me personally, I was asked a lot of questions about Jesus, about God, what is the kingdom, how do you understand grace? I didn't have answers to those things that someone close to me asked me. And I sought out answers and eventually was saved because of that seed planted. So, what is a parable? What is a parable? The Greek word for parable, parabole, is another, another way of translating that word parable that many people have agreed upon is that it means literally to throw alongside. So it's earthly stories 
thrown alongside messages with heavenly meaning. The earthly and the heavenly are thrown beside each other. There's that similarity and comparison going on there. And there's some truth to that, and I appreciate that understanding. But there's a New Testament scholar by the name of Dodd, who I quite appreciate in terms of his definition of parables. He says that parables are the natural expression of a mind that sees truth in concrete pictures rather than conceives it in abstraction. We might say perfectly reasonable abstractions. This is helpful because sometimes parables are not really narratives. They're not really necessarily stories. They're not really metaphors, but they're pictures. And what are they? What, what's the essence of what they are? There's some concepts that I've uh, taken from writers here. One is a poet, Marianna Moore, who has a famous line that I think sums up the essence of a parable. She says, there are imaginary gardens with real toads in them. Right? <laughs> Thrown beside. They're imaginary and they're real. Imaginary gardens with real toads in them. They are fictitious sayings that picture truth. They create an imaginary world that reflects our reality. Indirectly, but better than can be stated directly, oftentimes. What purpose do parables serve? Why is Jesus speaking all things in parables to these outsiders? Whereas direct communication conveys information in a clear, precise manner that is perfectly reasonable and may be abstract in some ways, the concrete pictures of parables are indirect and they carve out new ways of thinking about things that we're used to thinking about. They carve out new soil for water to run, in other words. They are actually a lot like the corresponding Hebrew word for parable, a shell, which is often defined as an elusive narrative spoken for ulterior purposes. So what is the ulterior purpose that Jesus is speaking in parables? It's to teach us about the nature of the kingdom. They're a means to teach about God's kingdom. God's kingdom is sometimes mysterious. Sometimes it's upside down, where the things that are seen as foolish by some are seen as the power of God to others. They're to teach us about the kingdom of God. And this kingdom, like I said, is sometimes mysterious and at least resists this totalizing power of human reason. And parables are a way for Jesus to get people to stop, to reconsider their ways, the way they see things, and to take action. They resist passivity. They resist passiveness in us by encouraging us to enter this imaginary image that is painted by Jesus. They ask us to enter into that and ask ourselves, for example, in this parable, what seeds are being planted? What ways are you preparing soil for seeds to be planted, to germinate, to grow, to take root? What are you doing in your life personally that makes sense of this parable in a way that grows the kingdom of God. They welcome us into it. And so, with that, I'm going to close in prayer, if you would. Um, close your eyes, and let's say um, a short prayer. God, we welcome you into this <clears throat> space, into our hearts. We encourage you to see us as children who need your shepherding, who need you as our gardener, who waters our soul, who provides nourishment for our body, our mind, our heart, so that we can love you more and we can understand your mystery and your kingdom more and more. When we come across a difficult teaching, when we come across something that we can't square away. I pray that we will learn to turn to you and your spirit to teach us all things. And all this is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.